It's our hi. <laughs> <laughs> I, I just Happy wanted birthday, to say, Megan. Happy, it's yeah. not my birthday. Oh, the other Megan. Oh, you Megan without an H. It's Megan <laughs> Wisdom's birthday. I was like, no, it's not. I have many months to go. Happy birthday, Megan Wisdom. Yes. Happy birthday. And is it Megan or Megan Wisdom? That's my question. Oh, gosh. Megan, I think, is just pushing it too far. <laughs> Let's find like, out what it is first. <laughs> why, you know, like, why would it be Megan instead of Megan? Wouldn't it then have to be M-E-E-G-A-N or maybe maybe M-E-A I would, I would allow for a Megan. But otherwise, I mean, Meg, Megan. But it's an anglicized Irish name. So who knows what it originally was spelled like, sounded like. But Well, there's right. two th ideas that I have, which is because one, <laughs> like I, it often is said, like if you're a if you're a British Megan, I think that it came from Margaret somehow. Uh, yeah. But I'm an Irish Megan and our family name was Mar, which is spelled M-E-A-G-H-E-R, which is similar to my name. Again, not a me word. Mm -hmm. So maybe I should be Maran. <laughs> no, no R. I don't know. I'm, I can't even try to get that. Anyway, hi, everyone. Welcome <laughs> to Where Are All the Women? I'm Megan Murphy, and this is Mary Lou Singleton. Hello. Um, I hope everyone can hear us properly. And if you can't, please let us know. I can hear... Mary Lou, um, <laughs> I can't hear myself. Um, uh, yeah, we're this is where all the women. We're here every Wednesday night at six p.m. Pacific and nine p.m. Eastern. Now it's seven p.m. our time, um, and uh, there's about eight hundred million things <laughs> to talk about tonight. So I suspect we'll get through about two of them. But how are you feeling this week, Mary Lou? I'm pretty good. It's been a tiring clinic week, but today is my Friday. I have tomorrow and, and the next day off. So that'll be nice. Um, oh, nice. Thursday yeah. is my Friday. <laughs> Thursday I've made it Friday. so. <laughs> <laughs> well, karaoke night is on Thursday. So I just permanently never schedule anything on Friday. And I tend to work on Sundays. So that's how nice. I've worked out my work week for myself um yeah I guess like the big thing this week was the cast review I feel like I'm starting to understand why I never like made it into the mainstream which is that I'm grouchy about every single thing that happens <laughs> <laughs> even when they're good things yeah did you read it I read the reports on it. I didn't read the entire cast review. I didn't have time, but I read the, you know, the Guardian article and the Telegraph article and lots of Twitter, Twitter commentary on it. Uh, yeah. So, I mean, for those who are listening or watching or don't know what we're talking about. So the, the Tavistock gender clinic closed permanently just at the end of last month, um, which is, I think, I mean, it's a big deal for the the destroying of kids' bodies by giving them puberty blockers and hormones. Um, I, I guess my concern around the criticisms that are coming up lately around the treatment, the treatment of so-called trans kids is that we're still operating in a treatment context and using the word treatment, um, which is one of my frustrations with the cast review, um, which uh, it was, yeah, so it's the, it's the review produced by, by Hillary Cass, hence the, the name, the cast review of the, I'm not going to explain this well, but of the treatment of trans kids in, in the gender clinic at Tavistock. Did I get right. that right? In the UK, right. And that's yeah. been the primary, for a while it was the sole pediatric gender clinic. And then um, now it's the, it, well, before it closed, it was the primary one, but it didn't it say in the review that they, there were some satellite clinics now also doing 
pediatric gender medicine. Oh, okay. I missed that. But I mean, probably, I guess, I mean, like, I, I, I'm, I, I'm glad that these things are happening. Obviously, the WPATH files and now the cast review. I'm glad that people are finally talking about how harmful and dangerous these so-called treatments are and how unnecessary they are and how kids are being rushed through these processes. Um, but the whole thing from the ground up, is a problem. Like, I think that yeah. the whole model needs, I mean, it should never have happened into the first place, which, you know, <laughs> I, the theme of, of this podcast and stream clearly is like the turfs, <laughs> the turfs are right. And the turfs were always right. Is that yes, what you came you up go. with last week? <laughs> it's great. Yes. And <laughs> I agree with you that it's infuriating to me to read this uh, so-called nuanced analysis of pediatric gender medicine that um, comes across in a very still wishy-washy way that maybe we need to reconsider what we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> to me, the the entire premise of transgenderism is illogical, sexist, anti-science, um, and, and wrong. Like, it's just, it's like a, um, it's an insane idea. It's, it's, it's not something we should be debating the merits of. And then no. especially pediatric gender medicine, why do we even need a review? To me, it's, um, these would, if someone came out with a review of whether or not clitoridectomy lowered urinary tract infections in women, and maybe we should reconsider whether or not we should be banning female genital mutilation, would they sit there and have a nuanced approach of that? Or would we still be rooted in our ethics and morality and say, no, you don't mutilate the genitals of women based on an ideology that's, that's misogynist? Right. And the whole problem with the trans kids narrative, which yeah, I mean, the whole conclusion of the cast review, I want to go through some of them, but I mean, the problems within these conclusions are almost all the same. Um, one of which says, there remains diversity of opinion as to how to best treat these young people. The evidence is weak and clinicians have told us they are unable to determine with any certainty which children and young people will go on to have enduring trans identity. So the debate remains like which of these kids are really trans and which of these kids really need puberty blockers and hormone treatments and surgeries. And the point is that none of them do, not a single kid does. And when you listen to, I was listening to this podcast that they did about um, the Tavistock Clinic, this podcast series, um, and the, the host of the podcast, talks to parents as well as um, people working at the clinic and running the clinic and talks to some of the, the youth who transitioned. Um, and the narratives are always the same and they've been the same from the beginning, ever since I started paying attention to this issue and ever since, you know, radical feminists started speaking out about the idea of trans kids it's always been like, you know, one of the girls was determined to be trans because she wanted to wear the boys uniform at school. And that, and it's always this, you know, like there's, en there's an endless amount of articles that are, oh, I knew my boy was trans because he refused to wear the boys uniform. Or I knew my girl was trans because she never wanted to wear these dresses. And I just, I keep saying over and over, like when I was a kid, I refused to wear the girl's ballet uniform. I insisted on wearing the boy's ballet uniform. I hated pink. I didn't like girly stuff. I didn't like girl things. I wanted to do boy things. I wanted to play with the boys. I wanted to wear, and I did. And I wore the black leotard and I wore the black ballet slippers. And, you know, I, and I had short hair and I wanted to wear like navy blue and dark green and jeans and sneakers. And 
nobody, nobody ever acted like there was anything wrong with me. I mean, there was no such thing as transgenderism then. So of course, and thank God, it was never suggested to me that I was transgender. Or I might be a boy, but the fact that I wanted to do boy things and wear boy clothes and hang out with boys never seemed weird to me. It never seemed weird to anyone else. I never thought that I literally wanted to be a boy. I taught myself how to pee standing up when I was a kid. And still, <laughs> I never, and I was very proud of myself. I also taught myself how to burp the alphabet when I was like 10. Like, did I ever once think, oh, maybe I'm actually a boy? Like, these are not, <laughs> the, the, I think these are normal things for kids. There's nothing wrong with a boy who wants to wear girls clothes or play with dolls or hang out with girls. And there's nothing wrong with girls who want to do boy things and they don't need treatment. They don't need to go see a psychiatrist. They don't need to see a therapist. Nobody needs to work through anything with them. They're totally fine. I know the whole ideology is based on odious sexist stereotypes. And no matter how many times we say that it, it, continues to be this well-accepted ideology that is now medicalized. <laughs> and what's crazy to me is the most likely to embrace this and push this and have the trans kids claim to be trying to fight sexism and misogyny. Yeah. And they're enforcing just the most regressive sex role stereotypes on not just their own children, but on everyone, on, on all the children forced to interact with that child and be gaslit into having to change their language around that child on all of us with the laws changing. Um, it's, I just don't get it. I don't understand how they do not see how sexist this is. No. And I don't understand why the parents who go along with these narratives, the parents who think, oh, my my girl wants to wear the boy's uniform, she must be trans, doesn't remember. Like, you know, a, a large part of the reason to me that this was obviously bunk is that I was like, well, I went through this when I was a kid and I had friends whose little brothers liked to play with Barbies and dolls. Yeah. And again, nobody treated them as weird. Like it was fine and normal, you know, thanks to feminism. <laughs> Exactly. <laughs> Women fought so hard to be able to wear pants, not because they had a sexual kink about pretending to be men and they got off on the idea of pretending to be men in pants, but because pants are more practical in many situations and they didn't want to be forced by law to wear skirts. My mom would tell me stories of, um, of women going to jail for, for wearing pants in her town and <laughs> how one day when she was in um, in high school, a girl came to school in pants, and the next day, a bunch of boys came to school wearing dresses just to mock the girl. And the girl had been kind of expelled, like she wasn't allowed to come to school for a week afterwards, I guess that's a suspension, for wearing pants. So women fought really hard to wear comfortable clothing and not be constrained by sexist behavioral norms about dress. And that was not that long ago. That was the generation before me. And then I was raised on free, be, free to be you and me, which was this whole campaign to get everyone okay with boys playing with dolls and, and girls doing whatever they want. Yeah, a very successful campaign that like, yeah, I mean, and the whole narrative has been completely turned around because of course the so-called advocates for trans kids who are, you know, protesting our events, holding signs that say, like, we love trans kids, we support trans kids, like, let trans kids be themselves. That's the whole narrative is let them be themselves. And meanwhile, they're not letting kids be, the, be themselves at all. And they're changing them in the most extreme, radical, right. irreversible ways. I mean, and the other, you know, I, so the other conclusions were, sorry. Yeah, tell us what else is wrong with the CAS report. Oh, <laughs> okay. Um, I mean, you know, the term gender-related distress is used throughout. So one of the conclusions was, for most young people, a medical pathway will not be the best way to manage their gender-related distress. For those young people for whom a medical pathway is clinically indicated, it is not enough to provide this without also addressing wider mental health and or psychosocially challenging problems. 
And I just, I read that and I'm like, I, you're just talking about puberty. Like, doesn't mm -hmm. every, doesn't every kid go through gender related distress when they're going through puberty, which is to say, first of all, you know, there all these hormones are raging through your system. So you're probably feeling kind of weird and crazy and all these things are happening to your body that you don't have control over for boys too, or, you know, mm -hmm. starting to get erections and things like that. And for girls whose bodies are changing and they're starting to menstruate and um, they're starting to be objectified and sexually harassed. On yeah. top of that, everybody's like growing hair in places yeah. they want to. And, and smelling, like you smell really bad. Like all of a sudden you smell <laughs> terrible. Terrible things are happening. Like, of course <laughs> right. you're distressed. Like right. it's gross. <laughs> like, why do I smell like this? I just remember being like 12 years old and thinking that. <laughs> what's wrong with me <laughs> right you have to start showering more than once a week <laughs> right. exactly you can't it's, it's complain rough. about bath time anymore and, and i think but, we've, we've always acknowledged adolescence is rough i i do think girls have more distress about um gendered aspects of it in terms of not wanting to become a woman because of rape culture and you know just the the um just the disgust, the societal disgust at females, bo female bodies, right? Like the, even, as much as we try to have like period pride, so many girls still feel shame about what their bodies are doing because of, you know, millennia of, of menstrual taboos. Well, yeah. And I think that the other thing that happens during puberty is all of a sudden you start being self-conscious about your body. Because when you're a kid, yes. you're not self-conscious of your body. Like no, when you're no, little, no. you're just like playing and running around in the dirt and like, yeah. yeah, like you're not thinking about your your body in that way. And all of a sudden you start to feel really hyper aware of your body. And for girls, you start to worry about getting fat and you are kind of, uh, some girls are getting fatter. I was not getting fatter and I was very jealous of the girls who were getting fatter. I was like <laughs> a really skinny kid and like people would pick on me for being too skinny. And my sister always told me I looked like a boy and I was like, didn't have any breasts or hips and I was just like gosh if I could only be one of those curvy girls and the, meanwhile the curvy girls I'm sure hated their bodies and you know were, oh, yeah. were worried about being too fat and so on and so forth it's like we all yeah this was we just all hate I think most of us hated every aspect of bodies at that yeah. age regardless of what they looked like totally like, what, what, what 14 year old girls is like god I love my body like I don't I haven't heard of that and then on top of like what you're experiencing personally, so many people around you are commenting on your body. I just remember feeling so icked out anytime male relatives in my family would comment on the development of the adolescent girls like, oh, she's developing, you know, <laughs> uh, so disgusting. The boys are strapping, are, are snapping bra, bra straps, right? Like that's, yeah. and upskirting is starting to happen. And you're really coming into this horrible uh, awakening uh, to rape culture and to how you're not safe in your body when you're female at that age too. Suddenly you're getting all this creepy attention. Yeah. I mean, I remember, I just, this is like, once again, like I feel, feel like another like important conclusion that we've come to in this stream is that we should just go back to 1994 and stay there <laughs> because, you know, I remember <laughs> being Yes, we should. <laughs> well, I remember being, I don't know, 11, maybe like grade five or six or something like that. And for Americans, that's the seventh grade um, or the sixth grade or the fifth grade. Um, <laughs> and we went to the, we would go to the pool for swimming lessons on pool day once a week or whatever it was. And I remember the boys were raiding the girls bodies like their breast size as they were getting up on the diving board i of course had no breasts so i think i was like flat as a board or something like that um and <laughs> i would it wasn't <laughs> it wasn't a good day for any of the girls <laughs> no no but i remember like because i had feminism because it yeah. was you know whatever it was like it was the early 90s then and so I like marched off to the principal's office to complain about the boys being sexist and it wasn't just because I wasn't getting complimented on my breasts um I was like very I was I was like a little activist from early on yeah so this was sort of routine for me 
and, and then I advanced right. into arguing about communism at the bar. Um, <laughs> but yeah. Like I just, and I think, and I do want to say like the boy, boys have a hard time in puberty too. Like girls do have an especially hard time for sure. And we start to learn to hate our bodies and, um, mm. and start to be subject to sexual assault and molestation and rape and sexual harassment and objectification. And now it's 800 times worse because there's pornography everywhere. So when you get to puberty, yeah. you've probably already seen porn and the boys that you're engaging with are looking at porn. Um, but, you know, the, I think the boys also start to feel self-conscious too because they're mm. developing at different rates. And so they also have to be in the locker room and, you know, their bodies are probably wildly different and some of the boys start to get picked on and bullied and, and so on and so totally. forth. It's such an awkward time and you're all at different phases. Like I was, right. I, I was on the early side of puberty, like not precocious puberty, but on the early side. And then the, so like my, I know. And then friends who were on the later side were jealous. We're all jealous <laughs> of each other. And then I think of the boys in my class and like, you, you know, you're 13 and there's, the kid who's like four foot six, and then there's the kid with like the full beard. It's <laughs> <laughs> like a mustache, broad shoulders. And we're all in different places with that. Uh, like, yeah. And so it's like, to me, like, it's like gender related distress. I'm just like, stop it. Stop pathologizing and medicalizing the perfectly normal experience of all of these kids. Like it makes me even angry because the report talks about, you know, the kinds of, you know, we still need services to deal with these kids and these youth who are clearly struggling with mental health issues or maybe eating disorders or autism or whatever it is. And it made me start to wonder, and I want to know what you think about this. I'm like, what do you, like, I didn't have any services. There were no services and I turned out fine. And I'm not saying, you know, like there's, sh I just, I don't know what those services should be. Like, I think we're over concerning ourselves with the mental health of kids, but maybe I'm, I'm going too extreme in my, my views of this. You know, I mean, at risk of disclosing too much, like I, I was, um, I mean, I did get those services as a kid. I had a really serious eating disorder. I, you know, I almost died of anorexia. Then I had really severe bulimia because I was miserable and I was being sexually abused by my grandfather. And I was, I was in this um, horrifically sexist, oppressive uh, Catholic culture. And, um, and I don't know if the services I got helped me. What helped me was my parents pulled me out of those services. But I think I was the first generation of kids there was still a lot of stigma. Like there was one mental health center in the little town I grew up in and it was called Irene Stacy for some reason. And that was like a big joke. Like they would just, you know, if, if you were acting too weird, other kids would be like, you need to go to Irene Stacy. Like <laughs> you know, get, Getting therapy was highly stigmatized. I did not like it that my parents were taking me there when I was, you know, skin and bones and refusing to eat. I, I mean, I was terrified. Yes. I was going to die. Like I could see why they were taking me there. And then, uh, I was part of, you know, in that group where the psych meds were just becoming a big thing. And um, it was right before Prozac. So they're still using like the older drugs. But the first time people are saying, oh, your brain chemistry is messed up. But none of it was helping. I was sick, sick, sick until my parents found um, a Jungian feminist therapist for me who was like, you're miserable because you don't agree with everything you know, with all the people. Like you're, you're miserable because of your circumstances. And let's try to keep you stable um and and no like just try to keep you okay until you can get out of this town so how what's the ticket to that let's help you do well in school let's get you scholarships to college like she she saved my life she was great she's like your life won't always be like this You're not going to be surrounded by abusive sexist assholes your whole life you know yeah. you can get better but so much of my starving was gender what would be called gender dysphoria now like i didn't like it that as soon as I started to go through puberty, pedophiles in my family started abusing me yeah. and I wanted to starve my breasts away and I wanted to starve my period away. I don't know if I wanted to be a boy, but I didn't want to be, I didn't want to be whatever this was that attracted this, this abuse. And, um, I was very depressed 
to find out that you can't starve your bone sure away. And like, no matter how emaciated I am, I will always have big hips. Like <laughs> it's just, you know, that was a, a sad thing. And then that continued, Megan, like I continued, um, even when I was eating and nourishing myself, I, I bound, like I would wear like two tight sports bras because I could not deal with guys commenting on my breasts. I've just, I just hated it. I hated getting that attention. And this is before porn. Yeah. I mean, I think I, you know, like I did know quite a few girls when I was in high school who struggled with, and even more so now, because as an adult, women are talking about their eating yeah. disorders a lot more than they did when we were just teenagers in high school um, and probably, you know, hiding it more, but who had, you, you know, bulimia, anorexia, um, and I, I mean, I have so much empathy for that kind of situation and it makes a lot of sense in terms of the, the context that you're talking about, you know, like trying to starve away your body. If, for example, you were subject to sexual abuse or molestation, which is, of course, another reason why so many girls are transitioning to escape. Exactly. That, that sexualization and that abuse. This um, is just the new iteration of, of that. Like this, and some of them still have eating disorders, but that has fallen out of fashion. And that was a marketed phenomenon. I learned to have an eating disorder from like 17 Magazine, L, like these, you know, I learned about yeah. it through women's magazines like that. I never would have thought of doing it if it weren't culturally around me. Like the I diets were really trendy yeah. when we were kids and teenagers. Like I remember yeah. at one point when I was little being like, maybe I should go on a diet. And my mom being like, do you know? And I was so skinny. She was like, do you understand what, uh, why do you think you need to go on a diet? And I was like, I don't know. Like I'm looking at like Jane Fonda's like fitness <laughs> record. Yeah. Record. <laughs> right. Right. <laughs> like, and I'm like, I don't know, diet. <laughs> This is what women do, right? And it wasn't even, uh, I mean, the diet culture was crazy, but there was also like a real glorification of anorexia and um, and kind of instruction manu manuals on it and stuff. So that was, that was socially contagious. Now transgenderism is socially contagious, often for kids suffering in the same ways. But so then what would be, oh, yes, Helena, thank you. Leave a comment, like and subscribe, support the channel. If you do have a comment or a question, use the super chat so we see it. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I guess I wonder what services would be required to treat things like eating disorders, which it's so funny because I remember quite a few years ago, writing an article about eating disorders and anorexia. And I don't even really remember exactly what it was about, but I think that I was saying something along the lines of, you know, this is about kind of like a cultural misogyny and um, sexualization. And like, you know, this is about girls learning to feel bad about and hate their bodies. And I got like swarmed and screamed at by these eating disorder industry people who kept it yelling at me and saying, this is a disease, this is a disease, like stop saying it's social, it's a disease. And they were so angry and I was so confused that what I was saying would be controversial in any way at all. And was like, I'd never encountered these eating disorder industry people before, but I suppose, you know, much like many other of these, these industries that need to exist so that people can maintain their funding and their jobs, they have to go with this particular model and narrative that treats anorexia as a, a sickness that needs to be treated. But I mean, what, like, what do you, what kinds of services would be helpful to girls then who are struggling with eating disorders and with anorexia and these kinds of things that are mentioned in, in the cast um, review alongside a number of other problems that might be misread as, you know, gender distress yeah. or transgenderism. I think community, I think exposure to women who have happy, satisfying lives, who've, who had eating disorders in adolescence. You know, I, I think um, for me, and it might be my personality that, you know, maybe this doesn't work for everyone, but Jungian therapy 
helped so much to just view my life as a story. Like what story am I telling with this behavior? And then it made sense. Like if I were a character in a short story and these things were happening and she starts behaving this way, what would it mean? And it, it, it became very clear to me how this behavior was serving me. Um, having people just acknowledge your distress, but that's very, things are so messed up right now. People, people don't want to get better is the other issue. Like I feel like part of our cultural contagion is, um, healing is not chic right now. Chronic illness is, and lifelong mental health identities, um, mental illness identities are, they're permanent and you can't do anything about them. And if you suggest that you are, then you're like attacking people with chronic illness or people with mental health issues. Right. And, and that it's so unfortunate and people were questioning the validity of their chronic illness or their mental health issues. I really do have PTSD and it's forever. And my brain is different now. And, um, uh, don't you understand that when you know when you put pe- my disorder in a functional MRI, our brains look different than normal people? I'm like, well, who who the fuck is normal? Like, who yeah. who's the control group? They're probably people just not into identifying with their distress. They're probably you know I don't know what that means at all. That um, you know what normal means, but generally it's people who've just learned to embrace the human condition and not want to grab a mental illness identity and strive to be healthy and functional instead of decide to be disabled their whole lives. That sounds so completely uncompassionate. <laughs> I don't want to say. People. Oh well, join the club. <laughs> <laughs> not everyone's deciding that, but um, it is very much being marketed that this is who you are. It's forever. And now it's how you find your tribe. Like you can't, you can't like go follow the grateful dead and find your people there. You find your people in the autism community. Yeah. So you guys can obsess about what's wrong with you and the fact that you can't fix it and you're different than anybody else and you need to be treated with meds. I mean, it's, yeah, I think that's so interesting and important because I feel like this, I mean, I, yeah, like I, I was going to, I'm like, I don't want to sound not compassionate, but I think I always sound not compassionate. So maybe I just need to go with it and not apologize. But, and it's not that I'm not compassionate. Like I am, I, yeah. I do feel awful and I, and I empathize with women who've experienced horrible trauma. You know, I've spent years talking to those women and as you and have, as, as have you, you know, on my podcast, talking to women who've been in prostitution and just yeah. been, you know, traffic and just abused in like the most unimaginable ways. Like if you talk to any of the women who worked for Vancouver Rape Relief, I mean, I think they have like almost secondary trauma from yeah. hearing from these women and, and, and dealing with them. But, you know, like by the same token, like, I mean, technically, I've experienced a lot of trauma in my life. You've obviously experienced a lot of trauma in your life, you know, and I'm fine. And I think the way that I'm fine, which is not like I'm perfect, but who's perfect? Um, We all have weird issues. Like I have I have some issues that I think, yeah, I probably I'm not, you know, like I can't change my entire personality and how I approach the world and how I approach relationships that much. But I certainly have made a lot of choices in my life to ensure that I am mentally healthy and that I'm not traumatized and that I'm not remaining stuck in my trauma. And some of those things have just been like to leave the bad situation and then not really Mm -hmm. obsess over the bad situation and just try to move on and to have like a healthier life and figure out how to make healthier choices in the future to avoid those kinds of situations, but not, you know, like not ruminating and not, yeah, dwelling on like, oh, well this happened to me. So now I'm screwed up forever. Right. And I need special treatment and I need extra time on all my tests and I need you to um, go out of your way to, to um, do extra because I can't. And to me, that's no way to live. Um, I don't, I feel like the goal of health of healthcare should be to get better, not to stay in your trauma forever, not to stay in your illness forever. And certain things can't be healed, but a lot of what's being marketed as mental illness identity, I believe, um, 
could be healed. You know, I think people could come to a place where they no longer feel identified with a mental illness diagnosis. I am. Um, oh. Yeah, I, I think it's continually shocking to me how defensive um, people get whenever you suggest that healing is possible. Yeah, yeah really defensive. Um, and yeah, I mean, I guess that I guess that part of that is that, yeah, some people don't want to get better. And I think that I think people feel defensive in the same way that they get defensive when you say that, you know, transgenderism is a lie and there's no such thing as a trans kid and no kid should be should go on puberty blockers and hormones because the people who have transitioned have done a real number on their bodies and can't go back. And yeah. so, of course, you would be defensive because that would be like a huge blow and really an overwhelming thing to try to deal with to acknowledge as you know many detransitioners are and have which right. is that you were lied to and you did make a mistake and now your body is changed for life mm -hmm. and there's not all that much that you can do about it like i i can totally understand why you would get defensive in that scenario and say well i had to i had to do this to survive, you know, this is, this is the real me. And I'm glad I did this because what else yeah. could you say? Like I made a huge mistake and I deeply regret it now. And there's nothing I can do about it. Like that's harsh. Yeah. And it's so interesting that the health justification of why these treatments are necessary medically is people will kill themselves without it. Is as far as I know, it's the only area of medicine where suicide threats are taken seriously, that they're encouraged. Everywhere else in medicine, we're taught um, you you don't give in to suicide threats. That's, that's borderline behavior. That's access to um, personality disorder behavior. We never give in to that. It's a sign you're in an abusive relationship if someone's making suicide threats. Um, but it's also, it's not a medical risk. Like, how about we heal the suicidality and I don't think there's there's any evidence that these treatments heal the underlying suicidality, like giving people like that. That's it's just I'm having a hard time just making it succinct. But it's crazy to say that there was a risk to my health, so I had to be sterilized as a child. Well, what was the risk to your health? Oh, I might kill myself if they didn't sterilize me and turn me into a, a synthetic imitation of the opposite sex. Yeah. Well, yeah. And I mean, I think that it's been this suicide threats from teenagers and youth has been going on for a, a really long time, you know, I like know. it's not particularly abnormal. Right. I, well, I, yeah, I mean, I was threatening suicide because I couldn't go to the Duran Duran concert. So <laughs> clearly that was a medical need for me. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. <laughs> she did. Hillary Cass did say one thing that I thought was I appreciated. I don't mean, you know, I don't have some big criticism of Hillary Cass. I don't know her. I don't know anything about her. It's more like what I'm frustrated with is the entire like the language surrounding so-called trans kids in this whole because the whole thing is total bullshit and should be treated as such you know like there's not you know maintaining the services but saying oh but this is only appropriate for certain kids and let's figure out which kids it's appropriate for i mean yeah. that's still a problem like we should just get rid of it all entirely from the concept Absolutely. of trans kids to words like gender medicine and gender related distress and the idea that anybody needs any kid needs huber, huber, puberty blockers and that any human really needs. I mean, if you're an adult, I know some people are like, we should ban giving hormones to adults to transition. And it's not that I'm opposed to that because I don't, it, like, I don't, I, I don't think anybody needs these and I think that they're bad mm -hmm. for people. But I mean, I think that it's sort of akin to cosmetic surgery, which is, yeah. I also think is largely bad, but I don't think I would go so far as to ban it because I think adults are free to make their own choices about their body for better or for worse. There are many places in medicine where 
we have stopped doing something, even though a certain number of people who were given that treatment that we've stopped doing think they benefited from it. There were people that argued that their lobotomies had helped them. And really? we don't do that anymore. Yes, there were there were people that were satisfied with their lobotomy. How did they describe that? Like what did I thought that people who got lobotomies were sort of out no, of it. <laughs> there's a great book called My Lobotomy, which is really interesting. He's not happy with his lobotomy. I can't remember the author, but it is this um it's written by this man who was abused by the mental health system of the time and was given a lobotomy as a, a teenager where maybe a preteen. And he's able to write a book and function like lobotomies were um, like gender medicine, completely unregulated, experimental. They they were different, had a different effect. Some, some lobotomists went through the nose, some went through the temple, some went through the eye. Like it's just, yeah, they didn't, they were just, you know, mad scientist stuff. But there were people who felt they benefited from lobotomy. There are women who promote clitoridectomy and think, you know, they benefited from it and they think women should have it. Um, there, there are plenty of places where there's a treatment that we decide we're not going to do that anymore because it's unethical and it's crazy. So we're not doing it anymore, even if some people liked it. And that mm. to me, what the approach we should take to pediatric transgender medicine. I, I don't know what will become of the children who've been transitioned, who are happy with the decision later in life or who are satisfied with it. Will there but be any of them? I mean, yeah, I guess there's like some example, like I suppose like Blair White is probably happy with all of his cosmetic surgeries. I mean, it was interesting, actually. I, w I watched part of an interview. I haven't, I don't follow his channel or work very closely, but I'd watched an interview with him recently where he, basically talked about having suffered a lot of trauma and I think abuse yeah. when he was a kid and and did relate that to his transition but you know that's that was actually what I was just going to say which was one of the good things that Hillary Cass said in 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 her like opinion piece on the report was that the rationale for early puberty suppression remains unclear with weak evidence regarding the impact on gender dysphoria, mental or psychosocial health. The effect on cognitive and psychosexual development remains unknown. The clearest indication is in helping the small number of birth registered males whose <laughs> gender incongruence started in early childhood to pass in adult life by preventing the irreversible changes of male puberty. So, you know, like she acknowledges that like this whole idea of transing kids is for these guys who want to avoid, you know, who want to be able to pass as adults, right? Right. So avoid and, getting and too masculine through puberty so that they can actually kind of trick some people into thinking yeah. that they're actually women. And those boys aren't having that thought process at that young age. The people, the adults around right. them are having that thought process. And in the same way, girls that we call, we used to call tomboys have always existed. Boys that in my generation we called little flamers have, have always existed, right? Like these boys with these um, proto-sexual behaviors. Honestly, I think there needs to be some, some examination of, um, how many of those boys are being abused and sexualized by the people around them. I think sometimes that's the root of it. And sometimes kids just come out that way, but to argue that they all should be sterilized and rendered incapable of orgasm and given drugs that are going to greatly increase their risk of cancers and other horrible problems because no one will want to fuck them like later in life it's, it's yeah, just, it well, doesn't make any sense to me like what kind of pass. person wants to have sex with a man who has implants and a neo vagina like fetishists yeah. and porn addicts right? exactly you're not they're or not deeply closeted men maybe who yeah. don't want to actually be out about being gay right yeah exactly it's not setting those boys up for a healthy satisfying life and it's lying to them and tricking them into thinking that, you know, they can find a nice husband someday or a nice man. You know, it's, it's, um, I've seen it happen to boys in my community that 
they're given this idea that if they are trans in childhood, they, you know, their life will be fine. But you're right, the men who are attracted to to that population tend to be fetishistic, sadistic people. Yeah. Um, H HXC in the comments just said Blair White transitioned as an adult and opted not to have any sex change operations. I suppose what I, I don't know anything about the history of his transition or transitioning, but I suppose what I meant is like it's those kinds of men who would be satisfied as yeah. adults with having started early on because then they can look like, you know, Blair White or look like a very feminine version of a man. Um, or, you know, as far as porn fantasies go. Um, I mean, the, the the other thing that's so messed up about all of this is that one, you know, one of these, these young men at, that was interviewed for this podcast, this Tavistock podcast that I was listening to, was saying, you know, for a while he thought maybe he was gay, but that didn't feel like exactly the right identity for him it didn't feel like the exact it didn't feel like it totally perfectly described how he felt and then maybe he thought he was non-binary um and then you know he thought maybe okay I'll just identify as a trans girl that seems easier but to I was like w at what point did we decide that everybody needed to know everything about our inner lives and how we related to ourselves and to our bodies, how we feel about gender, for example, you know, like why would Megan or her, just that word, Megan, her, she, why would I expect that word to describe who I am as a person? You know, every aspect of me and my personality, including, you know, how I feel about gender, how I feel about my body, how I relate to myself as a woman, you know, what my sexuality is. Like, why would her or Megan describe who I want to have sex with? Like, yeah. that concept in and of itself is so weird and should be totally thrown in the trash. Yes. It's the, that whole, what you're describing there is so weird. So this is a, a patient at a pediatric gender clinic saying this and we're talking about he had studies. transitioned yeah like he was he had been a patient and mm -hmm. i don't know how old he was i think i assumed he was a young man who was you yeah. know now who had transitioned i don't know how far he had transitioned and yeah was identifying now as a trans girl if, I guess. if we're talking about patients at that clinic who are children or, who are being given puberty blockers which means they are at the very earliest parts of puberty these are children who haven't even had sex yet and if they have a crime has been committed like this is mm. they, they don't they know nothing about their sexuality they know nothing about it but our culture is I sound like a right winger but our culture is inundating children with this this sexual propaganda and this this um gay and lesbian and lgbt propaganda that kids like five-year-olds are thinking am i gay am i straight it's like you shouldn't even be thinking about sex at that age you shouldn't even be thinking about who you want to have sex with this is um no. It's it's criminal. It's literally criminal that this is happening. Well, I guess do they do, are they thinking that it's just some kind of identity? Like, are they even thinking about it in terms of sex? I always, you know, when I was a kid, I all like I remember because I know a lot of feminists will be like, you don't, you're not thinking about boys or girls or who you're attracted to when you're a kid. But I I always had crushes on boys. Like I remember having crushes. Mm -hmm. I had like this obsession with a boy when I was like in kindergarten I was always obsessed with boys but I didn't think about you weren't thinking about sex of course no when you were a kid and I wasn't thinking about like heterosexuality when I was little I remember being when I was in high school you know by the time you get to grade eight grade nine you start being like am I a lesbian like am I you know like you start to ask questions about your sexuality and start to I, I remember being like worried like what if I turn out to be a lesbian I did not but um but I always had I had crushes on boys from the time I was very young, so I suppose it was very obvious to me that I was heterosexual early on. I guess that's true. There's, you know, I think there's this drive to pair bond in our species, though I think it's being driven out of our species by by social forces right now and um and medical and endocrine disrupting forces. Um, 
yeah, I think my, my five-year-old grandson um, is um, obsessed with finding a mate. Like he's, he's really into animal <laughs> world. And he's like, he's like, who, who, and he says things like, um, who will I mate with when I'm older? But he doesn't know what that means. Cute. Like, like we talk about how the coyotes, they have a mate, you know, the wolves, this is their mate. Like they, um, we are a very naturalist family and we don't go to a lot of weddings. So he doesn't know like the terminology of wife and marriage. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, he's, uh, you find a mate so, before winter comes. I know. Totally. Yeah. Everyone has to go into hibernation and he hasn't yeah. found a mate yet. I know, exactly. Exactly. Um, so I, I think there is this drive to pair bond in our species. Yeah, you're right. I had, you know, I had crushes in kindergarten, but I didn't have, because I hadn't been sexually abused at that age, I didn't have sexual feelings, you know, like it wasn't about my sexuality. It was about this um, drive to, to pair bond, which is not, it, you know, it starts before we wake up sexually, I think. That's a whole other conversation. I just don't think we should be putting um, terms like straight or gay on kids at that age, you know? No, I think it's totally unnecessary. But yeah, I just, I'm like, you know, we've just created this whole culture of like these com extremely, extremely self-absorbed people who feel yes. like it's important for the entire world to know everything about them. And it's not, I mean, you, you know, how I feel, you know, my, my inner life and like how I feel about gender, who I am as a person is for the people who know me, who I'm close with in my life. And even then most of those people probably aren't going to really totally understand. And that's fine. Like, I don't know what this obsession is about everybody knowing everything about you and, and what your politics are and what your ideologies are and, you know, how much of you is masculine and how much is feminine and so on and so forth. I mean, it's, it's like, don't you, know. you know, like just, you can have a private life. That's can, yeah. what, <laughs> what, what always was. That's private lives are only for neurotypical people. <laughs> It's not cool. <laughs> right, okay. I know it's, it's such a weird time. There's that old book from the eighties. I want to reread. It's from, I think it's from the eighties, uh, culture of narcissism by Christopher Lash. I remember reading that in high school and just being blown away by it that. and then reading it again, like 10 years later. And it, uh, I want to read it again. When he was saying how we're just evolving into this completely narcissistic culture and his predictions of what that was going to look like are coming true right now. Yeah, I should get that book. I'm like obsessed with narcissists right now. I have oh. been for at least a few years now because I was in a relationship with one for or some kind of relationship with one, a torturous relationship for a couple of years. And then when I left, I was like, oh, I think he was a narcissist. And then that Ander Huberman story came out and I was like, oh, that's exactly like my ex. <laughs> um, yeah. But in general, I mean, it's just, I guess it's like, I, I, I admit, I'm, admittedly, I'm sort of obsessed with diagnosing people with psychiatric problems and personality disorders. But, um, you know, it is, it is troubling how many male narcissists there are out there in particular, I, I'm sure there's female narcissists too, but it seems to be like a male thing. But then, yeah, but then besides that, there's just this culture of like self-obsession and the need to, you know, it, that whole thing of putting all of your mental health diagnoses and your pronouns um, and your politics and via a list of flags in your Twitter bio or your Instagram bio so that everybody knows every single opinion you have and every feeling you have about everything. I mean, that's like brand new and that's like a very yeah. generational thing. Although of course, like older people have taken that on in some ways. It too. is. And it's a real swing. I mean, the self-help movement, I think like not that long ago, up through the generation before mine where, you know, the Vietnam war was happening there, you were, um, you served your community, you served your country, you, your personal needs were not front and center in your life, right? Like you, you took care of your family, you, you, you know, 
the rites of passage for for young boys were getting called up to war like that is the opposite of a narcissistic experience in the in the other direction of of being dysfunctional right that you're just a, a cog in a war machine and and i think that it swung from that place of trying to heal that aspect of of not being a healthy culture and now it's gone so far in the other direction we need to swing it back like it's it's a mess right now no one no one feels responsible for anyone else everyone wants everyone else to take care of them this culture of youth diagnosis is terrifying to me when i think of um of what's happening in the medical schools where the the residents are refusing to work more than eight hour shifts and they want to talk about their feelings and they're being abused if they're expected to work hard and who will be our neurosurgeons who are capable of doing a 20 hour straight surgery if we're not allowed to to um work our residents hard who's who's gonna jump into the fires to put them out who will who will be the people who sacrifice to help others in a narcissistic culture well yeah and i'm sure that you know conservatives would say we've trashed masculinity for so long and we've trashed <laughs> men for so long so why would a man stand up and put himself in these you know situations these are mostly like male professions and and you know being a firefighter uh going to war yeah. um <laughs> apparently yeah. you know maybe being a neurosurgeon um although i think that women are fully capable of doing that as well of course yeah. but you know these kinds of things where you do put your body on the line and you're mm -hmm. putting your body on the line to defend others to save others to protect your country and so on and so forth like where is the incentive if we've devalued masculinity and we've we've called men toxic for so long i mean i don't know uh, I'm, I think there's probably some truth to that. Um, I also, you know, like if you go to urban places, you know, Vancouver, I think notoriously is full of these skinny beta males. Um, <laughs> like I remember watching this video of this family. It was like a, a mother and her husband or one of her male partner and their little kid, their toddler. <clears throat> and a bear comes along hiking through the woods and the mother leaps into action and starts like and picks up the toddler and like starts yelling at the bear and sort of directing the family and her skinny stupid little husband and his tiger hat and his toque is like trotting along behind them <laughs> it's like okay you're not somebody i would marry but you know like what what is this <laughs> i know we're a mess humanity so is just of degrees and can't protect his family from a bear <laughs> totally. Totally. I know. It's so sad. We're really a mess. What do you think is going to come of the WPATH files, the CAS report, the Mayo Clinic last week released that study that um, puberty blockers may not be irreversible and they cause testicular atrophy. There's a lot of of press coming out critiquing this. J.K. Rowling just tweeted that the Titanic is going down I'm not sure that's happening. Do you, do you think it's going to come down or not? Do you think we'll see an end to pediatric gender medicine? Yeah, I think that it's making a difference. Um, I remember this question came up at that Women's Day, that International Women's Day event I did in Toronto. And somebody asked, you know, like if this would make a big difference. And I was like, yeah, I, I mean, it clearly is making a difference um, because, you know, in, in various countries and in Canada provinces, I mean, one province, Alberta, um, we're starting to roll back access to puberty blockers and hormones and put limits and restrictions on, on who can access puberty blockers and hormones. So the ages are changing. Like I think in the report, it recommends that no one under the age of 18 be allowed mm -hmm. to access these things. And that's gonna become the norm. Um, I don't know what that means for the idea of trans kids or the trans kids narrative, or if somehow, some way, some kids will be determined to actually have gender dysphoria, another term that we should completely scrap, like that's right. not a real thing, gender dysphoria. Everybody has gender dysphoria. Give me a break. Um, uh, the word gender gives me dysphoria. I, like, what am I? Am I feminine and am I masculine? Do I have to pick one? 
If I could never hear the word gender again in my life, I would be so happy. It would improve the quality of my life so much yeah, because I, I have it. so much unhappiness, aka dysphoria, over this whole stupid topic. But yeah, yeah, I don't. We still believe in it. They still believe that some people, their soul got stuck in the their gendered soul got stuck in the wrong sex body, which is so asinine. <laughs> yeah, it is asinine. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that it it is making a difference and it will make a di difference. And I think it's a good thing. Um, I I don't know what it means for transgenderism because I feel like people are still really attached to the idea of transgenderism, particularly these men <clears throat> with porn addictions who who want to transition. You know, the autogynophiles as adults um and i think that maybe there'll always be some lesbians who feel like they would be happier as a man i think some lesbians do feel like maybe they're very drawn towards masculinity and maybe they want to cut off their breasts and appear more masculine or go by he i don't think that that's like a totally new thing actually um right. but i can't i just can't see now that we know all this and we'll continue to learn more about how many kids regret transitioning as adults, how horrible these hormones are for the body, um, you know, this the fact that it's completely unethical to sterilize children. Um, I don't see how we could go for, forward. Know it with all this being out there, you know. I, I say knowing it, but some people have known for a long time. But you know, now, yeah, it's it's un, it's undeniable now, right? It is undeniable, but people, <clears throat> so many things are undeniable, and and um, people still deny them. You know, it's um, yeah. and yeah, there. So many people are so incredibly invested in this narrative financially their whole life uh, you know if you've already transitioned your child i'm sure you're incredibly invested in this i would like to see it move to the point where it is really socially unacceptable to transition your child that everybody understands you're sterilizing your kid you're robbing them of any status any any possibility of a satisfying sex life it's a shameful thing to do you shouldn't do it yeah, I agree that yeah, it's it's a form of child abuse. Mm -hmm. Um and you know, I hope that <laughs> I hope that parents are paying attention and those who are going along with this trans narrative now who are like, you know, but my kid says it's trans, so I guess I have to go along with it. Like I don't want to anger them. I mean, I remember I interviewed Aaron Friday from our duty. Mm -hmm. It was really great. And I asked her because she she struggled with this. You know, she had a teenage girl who, you know, fell into the trans trend via Tumblr and all these online forums and, you know, via her friends and it becoming cool at school. Um, and she decided, you know, she was actually a boy and she needed to transition. And Erin just refused. She was mm -hmm. like, nope, not calling you by a different name. I'm not calling you a boy. These are my views. Like she, we'd leave out like her turfy books out around the house. She was like, I'm not pretending I'm not going along with this and fine. You can be mad, but also I'm taking away your phone and you can't hang out with these friends anymore who are identifying as trans. And she came out of it and now yeah. they have a really close relationship and i'm sure that would be yeah. really really hard as a parent i'm not a parent so i'm not going to pretend like that's an easy thing to do because i don't know but also because i'm sure that would be brutal and she, you know aaron says it was brutal like it was really yeah. hard but that's um, parenting it's like no you can't do this dangerous thing and no i'm not going to pretend to believe in something crazy and I've seen it again and again and again that when the moms hold out and say no, the kids desist almost universally. Mm -hmm. The only times I haven't seen that are contested custody situations where um, if the mom doesn't want to trans the kid, but the dad does, the dad knows that's a way to get full custody. 
but otherwise moms well and that's happened the other way us. around like there's a famous case that's in canada it, and bc yeah. where the the father refused to go along with the transition of his daughter and the mother wanted yeah. to and they were also going through a divorce and you know he lost custody right. and ended up in freaking jail he, parents horrible custody battles make people evil very frequently and they're terrible for children and this issue gets weaponized in it. So outside of contested custody battles, what I have seen over and over again, if, is, if, if both parents say no, it's not going to happen. But generally if the mom holds out, it's not going to happen. The kid will not transition as a mm -hmm. child. It, you know, parents need to not go along with this nonsense. Now at the same time, parents are being told, your kid will kill themselves if you don't go along with it. Um, some of the states are passing laws that you could, your child could uh, call CYFD on you and, and the child goes to foster care. Yeah. Yeah. That's really scary for parents, I'm sure. Um, yeah. This idea that they're being accused of conversion therapy and they're being accused of ch child abuse for not supporting the transitioning of the kid. Um but yeah, I mean, but I'm sure you have also met moms who are critical of transition and don't want their kids to transition, but are sort of still going along with it anyway, because they don't want to, I don't know, be yelled at by their kid, or they don't want their kid to run away from home, or, you know, they feel like they have to go along with it to be a supportive parent, which... I feel, I don't, I, I don't know if that happened to me when I was a kid, my, like my parents weren't not really that nice to me when I was yeah. a kid. <laughs> like, I mean, I don't mean like, you know, my mom loved me a lot, just very loving, but they didn't really let me do anything. <laughs> like, they wouldn't like, if I wanted to do something and they didn't want me to do it, I just didn't get to do it. Like I wouldn't have, they would have been like, well, I guess you're grounded until you come out of this. Exactly. I mean, that was the whole, like my, <laughs> screamed every I had to go to Catholic mass every week because I lived under my mom's roof. And if I wanted to live there and be fed, I had to follow these rules, right? It, like parents used to be in charge. And if it's like, if you want to be in charge, you get a job and move out. You know, it's not, parents need to go back to being old school that way. This, the cult of child-led parenting is insane, which it's even deeper than I thought, like writing that article, my latest article on my Substack about about how did we end up in this situation where kids aren't getting out of diapers until age four as the norm that comes from child-led parenting. The guy who invented the term child-led parenting, Terry Brazelton was on the payroll of the diaper industry <laughs> and convinced all these what? parents not to start potty training until the child expressed readiness until the child decided to potty train. So we've gone from the Does average any age child naturally potty trained. <laughs> Kid, this whole idea of like get you know waiting for kids to be ready to do the thing they don't want to do is insane. Kids will never be ready to do the thing they don't want to do. It's like I didn't want to do anything when I was a kid. I was not like an independent child at all. Like just, I'm sure I would never would have learned how to tie my shoes. I would have just kept wearing Velcro totally. sneakers for the rest of my life. I certainly never would have walked to school by myself. Now we have multiple, like at this point, two generations of parents, because Brazelton started this nonsense in the 60s. Then in the 90s is when uh, Pampers hired him to do a whole ad campaign with the giant diapers, the size six diapers for kids up to like 40 pounds, like kindergarten diapers to normalize that. Like you know, this is insane. So it's been going on for decades. And now we have parents who are like, I don't know what to do. My four-year-old will only eat goldfish crackers. I know. I'm like, well, don't buy goldfish crackers. Your kid's not going to starve. Like, so your kid's four, not like, literally just going to never eat. <laughs> exactly. Like don't have them in the house and only offer your kid nutritious food. It's we are in a mess. So I do think a lot of the going along with the trans stuff comes from that two generations of of propagandizing parents that the kids know what's best, which is insane. It's just an insane way to think. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, someone in the comments said you can't be your kids best friend. And that really screws up. Like don't you know like kids or you know when you're a teenager and they're like mom acted like or their their mom would like come party with you guys <laughs> you know it was, always, it was like weird and like the kid turns out weird 
It was kind of pathetic and weird. I remember my friend Sam's mom doing whippets with us. And I was like, this is wrong. I don't even want to do whippets anymore if there's a mom here. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> Like you're supposed to be the parent. You're not supposed to be the best friend. We know we're doing something we shouldn't be doing. And we don't want a mom here doing it with us. No. Yeah. You don't want to see adults in that situation anyway. No. Like it's, you don't want to be around like you don't want to be around adults when you're like drinking underage or doing drugs no. underage. I mean, first of all, adults are lame and that's like kind of embarrassing if you're a teenager and you're like, oh, drunk adults, gross. Right. Um yeah, I, I think that um, I don't know what's going to turn that around. I, you know, we just need to shift the culture of parenting. Things that maybe are changing, but we're so we're so polarized and divided that I'm not sure how this is going to play out. So many. No, people we are, need to just go red state, blue state for the whole world. <laughs> right? How are we supposed to live with these people? Like, you know, the people, the only people who believe in this trans kids, transgenderism, like uh, defund the police, like DEI, like, you know, these are these like middle, upper class, urban progressives. They have no idea what's going on in the real world. They don't engage with working class people. They don't understand what most of the world thinks about, you know, they don't understand the immigration issue. They don't understand why working class people are angry about, you know, open borders and letting in all these immigrants who are taking all their jobs and so on and so forth. They just accuse them all of being racist. And, you know, the defunding cops, which screws, you know, black communities, poor communities, women, um, like, I don't want to be around these people. <laughs> I know. <laughs> I guess I shouldn't say that because maybe, like, I'll have a positive influence on them. And I think it's good for us all to be around different kinds of people. But they don't – I don't know – you know, they're just, they just bully me, right? They just yeah. act like I'm a horrible person. You know, progressives are the most hard-headed, entitled, self-righteous people in the world. You know, they're the most ignorant people. And, you know, the people who actually are least engaged with diversity and diverse communities and diverse people out of anyone, because, of course, you can do that if you're privileged enough and you just work inside your house. You don't have to go out in the world and be around people who right. aren't like you. You have to be around somebody who gasped, you know, voted Republican or conservative or whatever it is. Um, <clears throat> and and these people think that like they they're sure that they're right about everything and that everybody else is horrible and wrong and bad um and you know right. i don't think they're bad i think they're just stupid i guess i'm doing the same kind of thing they were they are <laughs> like, well, i think not when stupid the, i shouldn't that's not even true i'm just being glib when the pendulum swings you know the conservatives will be acting this way and forcing their beliefs onto everybody and it will be a drag to be around them. And you know, it's just like it was in the Bush years. Um, I just think it's so unfortunate that the, the people in power behave like the people in power. What I find most depressing about progressives though, well, there's so many things I feel find depressing, just how propagandized they are when they think they're smart. They, they believe they treat me like I'm <clears throat> stupid. Like, do yeah. you really think I'm stupid? Like, if I wanted to be, I don't think that any degree makes you an intelligent person. I think there's lots of stupid yeah. people with degrees and there's lots of really smart people without degrees. I, if, they, now, like, if I wanted yeah. to prove it, I could be like, I have a master's degree in the thing that you're talking about. I am well educated. I read all the time. My entire job is interviewing and learning from other people. But you act like I'm a dumb dumb because. I don't want to vote Democrat. You don't think the right way. Right. With it, you don't you don't know how to parrot the propaganda. Like believing that they're they're brilliant because they can parrot the talking points that they heard on on NPR that morning is, is so depressing. So that is upsetting to me. But the fact that they're so captured by big pharma is the worst part of it for me with the transgender madness with um, celebrating, like you hear progressives celebrating that they just went with their 15 year old who's not even sexually active yet to get her an IUD because Trump might win in the fall and she needs an IUD. Like it's just mm -hmm. letting big pharma rule their lives. The psych meds, the um, 
the, you know, this, the sixth vaccination that, you know, celebrating every new um, drug that comes on the market, not critiquing, not critiquing that aspect of our culture that's like ruining American culture. Everyone is on drugs and progressives are on more drugs than, than anyone else. Oh yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think it's like liberal women. Yeah, they don't get it. That identifying they're, most as having these mental health issues that they need drugs for, right? And they have no idea that they're just walking shills for big pharma. They yeah. they have no idea. And it's that is profoundly distressing to me. Yeah. And how do you parse, like, you know, claiming to be, you know, I think a lot of people think that they vote Democrat or NDP, for example, um, because they care about the little guy and they don't want to support the rich and, you know, eat the rich. And, you know, we're, you know, like Elon Musk is the, the enemy and we're anti-corporation or whatever and fight the power and so on and so forth. But they're completely pro-corporation. Not only do their politics align with virtually all corporations and wealthy people, just not Elon Musk, but most of the other ones. Mm -hmm. <laughs> But, yeah. you know, like they're, yeah, they are. They're fully shills for big pharma and refuse, I think, even now to believe that the vax was just a con, like it was just a big pharma money grab. So the, there had to be a mandate so that everybody, you know, they just made millions and millions, maybe billions of dollars off of this bullshit vaccine and won't even think about the fact that I don't think ever before in history there's ever been a vaccine that has come out this quickly no. and with zero evidence that it does anything no never mind no. the long-term consequences if there are any with brand new technology like mrna technology had never been used in humans before it was approved for human use in 2020 for the development of this vaccine no they don't question any of that it's safe and effective it's safe and effective and you know, if yeah, you like, want since when is like why would you like trust in pfizer I know, you know what's right? wrong with you and you and uh, you could you claim to be concerned about drug overdoses which skyrocketed during covid or worse than ever because of big pharma because of the opiate crisis exactly exactly they don't they their blind spots are so glaring and the reason it bothers me more than i'm bothered by religious conservatives is religious conservatives have um uh, guiding ethos that I'm not saying there's not hypocrisy there, but um, though I disagree with their philosophy I and their ideology, I feel like it, um, they're, it's, they're more clear about who they're serving in, in many ways than, mm -hmm. you know, I don't, I don't like capitalism, but you have to go get that Pfizer shot or you're going to lose your job. <laughs> it's like, the the inability to examine like there's no there's no um guiding the narrative for them they just parrot whatever they're told and they pretend that that's progressive i guess yeah. it is progressive because we're progressive into the into this hellscape but they pretend it's radical which it's not yeah i mean i guess i'm not is you know does progressivism mean like you're trying to move towards a better more idealistic or a better more what is the word that i'm thinking of a better world i'll just say that is that the idea behind progressivism yeah i think that is the original idea i mean it's a term that comes out of um the early part of the last century i don't know what it means anymore it's been so co-opted by by the ruling class funders of the ngo industrial complex you know what does it even mean we're progressing toward what they want for us and you know this funded activism so depressing yeah so do we um do we want to talk about anything else so like the the well, Trump abortion stuff? yeah I, guess. I mean that's <laughs> just another like <laughs> another <laughs> like you guys are all wrong nobody understands this like which is true you know i'm sort of endlessly frustrated by this debate i know that you are too because i think you know what Trump came out and said he's getting attacked by the right and by conservatives and, and other Republicans. And then people are also <laughs> claiming, sorry, I think we're just barking at noise. Um, 
I think I heard somebody calling my name. <laughs> Okay. Anyway, like, you know, his, his position is being treated as pretty moderate, which I think is essentially what he said something along the lines of there's somebody banging on my gate outside. Should I go check and see who it is? Can if I pause want this to. for a second? And they're just going on. So I feel like it's something important. Are you able to talk for two minutes? Yeah, I can talk for two minutes okay, about I'll be abortion. Right back. Sorry, okay. yeah. Explain to everybody what what you, they should think about abortion. <laughs> All right. So we have this issue that Trump, who is, in my opinion, a con man who understands um, social trends and how to capitalize on them, has gone from um, his position that he ran on in the last electoral cycle, the last two electoral cycles, which was he was going to ban abortion entirely and sign a constitutional amendment banning abortion. Um, and he takes credit for Roe versus Wade, which ended the constitutional um, federal right to abortion for American women. He has now pivoted to a position saying he will not sign any federal legislation banning abortion on a federal level and that abortion should be regulated by the states, which has been part of the talking points of the anti-choice movement for my whole life. Like this, this should be returned to the States. The decision of whether or not a woman has autonomy over her own body um, or whether or not she is a state regulated incubator should be decided at a state level, not there should be no federal right to bodily autonomy for women. And a lot of the pro-life movement are furious about it. They're really upset because even though many of them said this should be a state's rights issue, we all know they also were simultaneously saying they want to pass um, uh, uh, an amendment to the Constitution saying that life begins at conception and that fertilized eggs, embryos, and fetuses have, have rights. So I'm <laughs> talking about how Trump has pivoted to say abortion be, should be returned to the states, and much of the pro-life, the anti-abortion movement is upset because they want to ban it at a federal level. Yeah. Well, and I was, I just like, you know, I love Megyn Kelly, but her, the way she talks about abortion is drives me insane. Like I was listening to her podcast today and she was like, you know, literally she was just like, well, Democrats just love having abortions. Democrats just love killing babies. You know, like all these women are proud to have abortions and they're just going to have abortions whenever they feel like it for any reason at all, not because there's a health problem or whatever. And, you know, and this is the position that most conservatives and right wingers, I think, take with regard to the Democrat position on abortion and like n nobody, I mean, it's not really their fault because I didn't really understand the history of abortion either until you taught me about it. But, you know, it's just not, people don't understand that abortion was not invented with second wave feminism. Like abortion right. was not invented when it became medicalized and when it became a legal debate. It's that women, and you know, when you say, and I have said on Twitter, you know, like, you know, women, you can't stop women from having abortions. Women have been ending pregnancies from the dawn of time. Um, and then, you know, some daily wire guy will be like oh well murder has been happening since the beginning of time and i understand that argument because i use that you know with regard to people who say that prostitution is the oldest profession right. on earth and i'm like okay well that makes it okay like people do lots of horrible unethical things and they've been doing those things forever so that doesn't make it okay but that's not really my point, like, it doesn't matter if it's okay or not. It just doesn't matter. You just don't get a say. Like, there's nothing you can do about it. You can make abortion illegal all you want, but you can't stop women from ending pregnancies. You just, you just can't. I'm sorry. Like, it's just not possible is what I mean. <laughs> like, right. There you are can make it. You can try to throw women in jail for having miscarriages if that's what you want. That's what you're right. arguing, I suppose, if you actually want to make abortion illegal. Well, we, we have examples of countries which have, have made abortion illegal, and we know the results are terrible, and no one is happy with it, and the people eventually overturn that. 
people need to look at the Ceausescu re regime in Romania that banned all abortion and most birth control. This was a godless communist regime that wanted to increase the population. Um, it was not about respect for life or, or anybody's religion. It was God's forcing, forcing women to have babies. And um, all women were, their menstrual cycles were policed. They, they, um, you know, they were followed around to make sure they didn't have abortions. The, what happened? The orphanages were overflowing. Women were dying from illegal abortion. Women were sneaking into other countries, um, risking their lives, being shot at the border because that was the Iron Curtain. You couldn't leave the country you were in when you were in those communist states that that controlled the movement of their citizens. Women would risk their lives trying to get to the neighboring countries to get an abortion. There were under illegal, very unsafe abortionists. But what actually happened was women had a lot of kids that they didn't want and they abandoned them in orphanages. And the Romanian orphan story is horrific. It's just um, those kids were just warehoused and they all have attachment disorders. They're really terrible. Um, so that's a communist regime that banned abortion and it was horrible and no one liked it. And when Ceausescu was assassinated, this was the issue that people, I and mean, he wasn't assassinated, he was publicly executed. People celebrated the return to legal abortion as one of the main reasons that they're, they wanted their country to be free because of how awful it was. But then we have Ireland. I mean, we all know about the story of Savita Halapavanar, who was um, left to die because she was miscarrying a 17-week fetus and then still had a heartbeat, and they wouldn't intervene and end the pregnancy because abortion was illegal. And that has happened here in the United States, where women have gone into, into near death. I don't know if any women have actually died, but Catholic hospitals have done the same to women here. There's a great article on uh, miscarriage management in Catholic hospitals in the American Journal of, of Public Health um, from about 10 years ago that is just horrific, where they're letting women bleed out because the baby has a heartbeat. It's just, I'm so, this, our, this topic just enrages me. And I guess I'll pull it back in to just say the issue is whether or not women are full human beings who get to decide what to do with their bodies, or are we state regulated incubators? I believe human life begins at fertilization. And I also believe you can't make a woman be an unwilling incubator for another person. And I don't know why the, the argument segues away from that basic reality of this. Well, because people say, you know, well, what about the child's rights? Like, it's not like, because I'll be like, it's her body. And as long as it's in her body and reliant on her body for survival, she gets to decide because it's her yes. body um, until it can survive on its own outside her body, then it's still her body. And you can't, you know, like I support bodily autonomy no matter what. And I thought you did too. Um, right. But I think they, then people will retort people will reply to me and say like well what about the child's rights well the child is you know, not like, autonomous you kill a life are you allowed to kill a life because she you can't make someone be a life support system for a child or any other human being you can't do it and it's it's you know to me, I have to separate from it and just be with whatever woman is making that decision for the all of the thousands of reasons a woman might be ending a pregnancy. Um, I can't, I can't insert my own morality into this this situation. It's about her, but to me, it's like you can't make her continue to risk her life and her health and her financial well being and her her mental will, wellness. Um, to to be an incubator when she doesn't want to no it's draconian um i, I mean i guess I, w I want you to talk a little bit about how women i mean I, I don't know what term to use i don't know if it would make sense to use the term abortion but like you know when i say like women have been ending pre pre pregnancies for all of humanity you know for all of time um and I think sometimes it was called like restarting menses or something. Menstrual like regulation. Menstrual right. regulation. Like wasn't that, that, that was just a form of natural birth control until relatively 
recently in terms of like, right and history. so so until like the late 1800s abortion was birth control like that i mean I guess there were condoms available somewhat but for the most part um abortion was the main way women were regulating their fertility and not having more children than they wanted to have for a lot of reasons like you you know there were no birth control devices women didn't have a choice whether or not they were having sex and you know like when mm -hmm. marital rape was was legal through the 80s in the united states um mm -hmm. which again like i'm so tired of people not acknowledging recent history and um if a woman discovered that her period was late there were many people um in who offered menstrual regulation services to help her get her period back. It was considered like returning, getting your period back. So ending a pregnancy was considered a fairly normal thing. And in English common law, they said that you can terminate a pregnancy through what's called quickening, which is um, when you start to feel when you notice the baby moving. And that's around 20 weeks pregnant. That's half, halfway through the pregnancy. After that, um, it was considered a baby and you shouldn't do it. And honestly, for women's lives, you probably shouldn't be doing it at that point any anyway. Mm -hmm. All over the world, women have known <clears throat> herbs and cervical stimulation techniques and other practices to get the body to release a pregnancy. There is a 6,000-year-old um, acupuncture text, Chinese medicine text, that talks about the abortion points and how to open the chong and get the woman to release a pregnancy. I know many women who've had successful acupuncture abortions. That's just one ancient tradition that's been doing this for at least mm. 6,000 years on and the written record says at least 6,000 years. So well, and it's never been like an eight month thing. Like that's never been a, a, a common thing. You know, this was the other thing that Megan Kelly yeah. was, I don't want to target Megan Kelly again because I like her, but like, you know, yeah. this is something that conservatives will, will say all the time. Like, oh, well, you know, th these, this radical, these radicals, these Democrats, these like radical feminists, you know, they're not using radical feminists in the same way we do, of yeah. course, but like, you know, they want women to just be able to kill their baby up until eight or eight or nine months, I think was what Trump said, like nine months. But you know, that's not, no, abortion you know, has always been something that for the most part has happened very early in the pregnancy. Like there's no rational yeah. woman in like a healthy situation who is going to, I don't, I, I have a hard time even calling that an abortion at eight months. Most late abortions are, um, when people have found out that that there's a birth defect that's incompatible with life outside the womb and they just want to want to get the process over with. Um, yeah. yeah right, and yeah. that's a horrible, that's just a shit situation. And anybody mm -hmm. who's going to judge a woman in that situation is a terrible person, you mm -hmm. know, like that, that is her choice to make in a terrible situation. And there are only like three, I think there are only three, clinics in the whole country that will do those late, late abortions. And honestly, some of those abortions are happening because states have passed these 20 week abortion bans that say you can't induce labor in a baby, in a pregnancy where the baby has a lethal birth defect. Like I've, I've been at many births that would be considered late term abortions where women wouldn't view what happened as an abortion. Like we found out the baby had a lethal birth defect Often the mom's getting sick because babies with genetic problems, the placenta has genetic problems and the mom gets sick. Sick babies make sick moms. And so mm. we're deciding to induce a baby that is, you know, induce a pregnancy, like induce labor at 24 weeks and let the baby die in the mom's arms. And that is considered an abortion. And that is being banned all over the United States. And those women who find out that they have a pregnancy where the baby is not going to survive are now being forced to come to the state I live in and have an actual abortion, which is a much more traumatic and awful procedure because it's happening in an abortion clinic and they have yeah. to kill the fetus before birth or else it's not legal. And this is being created by misogynists, insane right wingers who don't understand the nuances of women's lives. Like those, no. those are considered abortions. Those states are also passing laws that, um, you can't just let a baby die in the mom's arms. If there's a heartbeat, you have to do heroics. So these children who are not going to survive 
no matter what's done, are being rushed to the NICU, put on, on ventilators, tortured, and then the parents have to decide when to pull the plug. And nobody, it's just horrific. It's a horrific situation rather than just letting a, a 20 week preemie die in the mother's arms. They're like, no, you have to do heroics. And because there's like a 1% chance the baby might survive. And they won't let parents make their own decisions in these horrific medical situations. So most of late term abortion falls into that. Um, yeah, yeah, I mean, I just even, you know, like even like a lot of liberals will say things like, well, you know, like, sure, like it's fine for there to be abortions up to six weeks or something like that. And, you know, exceptions for rape and incest. And if the life of the mother is in danger and they're like, this is a reasonable position and this is a position that everybody could agree on. And the right wingers who are saying that even that isn't OK or crazy and it is crazy, but I don't think that's a reasonable or a moderate position. I think it's still like I just I, no matter what, I'm like, you don't get a say at all. You yeah. actually don't get to have an opinion on what any woman does with their body. You don't get to vote on it. You don't get to have a debate with her about it. Like, you, it's none of your freaking business. Sorry. Mm -hmm. And you don't sound moderate to me. You don't sound liberal to me at all. You sound like you don't understand how women's bodies work and you don't understand the realities of women's lives. I mean, there's plenty of other reasons that a woman would want to have an abortion and whether or not she's like, whatever, like whether or not she's behaving like all these these Twitter knobs are where it's like, it's just a bunch of slutty women who just want to have abortions willy nilly. Like, I don't yeah. know women like that, but um, you know, I don't know most of the women, you know, it's not a desirable thing to have an abortion, but even if it were, it's still none of my business. But like, well, you know, what, if you're in a situation, if you're in a relationship with an abusive man, yeah. no, you don't want to have a baby with him because then this kid is going to have an abusive father for their whole life. They're going to be screwed up and you're going to have to be attached to this man and be yeah. abused for the rest of your life. Like, is that yeah. the, the right thing to do? He's going to torture you through the court system. Yeah. He, you know, the, the child is going to have all sorts of problems because they're going to be, they're born on a battlefield. They're going to be in and out of courts. They're going to, yeah, just be um, fought over like a box of books. Um, right. A lot of women wake up to the fact they need to get out of an abusive relationship when a pregnancy happens. And I feel like, you know, I mean, my woo woo things, I feel like there is a spirit to every pregnancy and I don't think every spirit wants to be incarnated. This is like, I like revert to my Catholic background, like this, this valley of tears, this world of suffering, not every, every pregnancy wants to come here. And I think mm. there's a spiritual argument that could be made that sometimes that pregnancy is there to get that woman out of that that relationship to wake her up to the fact she's with somebody who would likely kill her or a child or at least torture her. Totally. So, well, cause men, yeah. abusive men do start to often they'll start the abuse while the woman's pregnant right. or at least they'll start to exhibit, you know, how controlling they are by being like, Oh, you can't do this and you shouldn't eat that because the baby. And right. And the, kind of the thing, abuse right? ramps up during pregnancy almost universally. And yeah. the, you know, the most dangerous time, the, the time women are most likely to be killed by a, an abuser is when they leave. The second most likely is postpartum. That is when men kill women. And I've seen that in my own community. It's, it, you know, it's, it happens. It happens pretty frequently. So then these conservatives often like the more moderate conservatives are like, well, even in, in Europe, you can't get an abortion past 16 weeks. The laws say after 16 weeks. And that may be true for abortion on demand for maternal choice reasons, but you can get a medically indicated abortion after 16 weeks in every, you know, every country where abortion Was is I legal. Was I six weeks when I meant 16 weeks earlier? Sorry to well, interrupt. Well, six weeks is what they're passing these six-week spans, which are basically a total ban on abortion. Okay. That um, is what I mean. That's say. what, yeah, that's what's <laughs> happening in um like Texas is passing these six weeks ban. Texas has a six week ban that also says you have to do an ultrasound to confirm pregnancy, but you can't see a pregnancy usually until six weeks. So if you can confirm a pregnancy by ultrasound, it's too late to do the pregnant to do the abortion. So six week bans are happening, which are basically total bans on abortion. And then um, in like most of Europe, 16 weeks is the cutoff for abortion on demand, like abortion just because uh, a woman needs to not be pregnant by her own decision making. But those 
countries will still let you have an abortion if you found out your baby doesn't have a brain. They will still let you end a pregnancy if you found out your baby doesn't have any kidneys. They will still let you have mm -hmm. an abortion if the pregnancy is making you very sick. It's not, um, and you don't have to go in front of a panel of priests or judges to do it. It's considered a medical necessity of a procedure after that. And most of the late term abortions would still be legal in those countries because there's so few of them to begin with. And almost all of them are in cases of lethal birth defects or the mother's life is, is endangered. Right. I mean, so, and it, you know, there's, there's very, very, very few people who actually believe that abortion should be illegal in all circumstances. So I was reading that the latest Gallup poll says 52% of Americans describe themselves as pro-choice, while 44% identified as pro-life. 34% said abortion should be legal under any circumstances, which I think is great. I was surprised by that, actually. That's compared, a third of people, yeah. Yeah, compared to 13% who said it should be illegal in all circumstances, and a majority, 51%, said abortion should be legal only under certain circumstances, a view that encompasses a wide range of policies, but I think that essentially matches what Trump is arguing. Um I, you Trump know, I don't think he was specific about what he wanted, right? He was just saying it should go back to the States. And then he was kind of vague about like not opposing abortion, but also trying not to be considered too liberal. On he sees, he yeah, he's, he's astute about cultural trends. Um, he sees that this is a losing, um, a losing issue for Republicans. People don't want abortion to be fully criminalized. And we're seeing no. that, um, you know, these, I think it's so dumb. Like they are going to get screwed if they take this position. Like there's obviously there, yeah, yeah there's, sorry to interrupt. There's just such a small number of people who think that there should be a full ban on abortion. And I feel like the Republicans are winning over a lot of people because the Democrats are so crazy on so yeah. many issues, including the trans thing, including on immigration, um, yeah. and including the fact that they have a you know walking skin bag as president. Um, but you know, they're they are losing women on yes. abortion. And some men as well. Like this is the issue the Republicans are crazy on of just this complete yeah. um, inability to budge on it. And I I wish we could return back to the days where politicians could say, I'm personally opposed to abortion, but I, I think it's a moral issue and it should be, it shouldn't, it shouldn't be criminalized. Um, but everyone's so black and white on it now. Um, but in, you know, very conservative states that vote Republican in presidential election and congressional elections have had referendums trying to criminalize all abortion in, in the last couple of years. And the side, the abortion rights people have won. So Ohio just, um, just codified the right to abortion. Um, Kansas shut down an abortion ban with a referendum. So when it's put to the people of the state, and they mm -hmm. come out and vote in the privacy of the voting booth, most people don't want to criminalize abortion. Hmm. And I okay. think it's, I think even the men, um, men understand that men understand men, they understand rape happens. A lot of conservative men do not want to be forced to raise a rapist child. <sighs> yeah, that's a good point. Um, and I mean, I do, I do get frustrated because I feel like a lot of men with opinions on abortion don't really understand and they don't really understand how women's bodies work and so on and so forth. Um, but and on, on the other side, I get frustrated with the left where a lot of men are supportive, have told me to my face, they're supportive of abortion because they want women to have sex with them without, you know, without, you know, they want, they want women to be more sexually available. Yeah, and they don't want to have to be responsible, right? right? Like they don't want to have to think about any repercussions. They want to. I mean, this this is this is a whole other topic, but this is the you know a main problem with the like two consenting adults mantra, which is that you know men don't have to think about how they 
impact women when they have sex with those women, even if the woman wants to, even if she consents, I'm not talking about rape, but you're, you know, it's like you can throw every single other ethic and moral out the window because like she wanted to. And it's like, no, you can't. First of all, men and women are different. Women can get pregnant. There's lifelong repercussions for women. Second of all, women catch feelings more easily than men do. We're biologically built to bond with men that we have sex with. And you can't just have casual sex with us and pretend like that's fine, that you aren't responsible towards her and how she feels. And I know that's like, I think that's like a quite could would be quite considered radical thing to say right. nowadays to be like no you shouldn't like I don't I don't think that you should have sex with a woman that you don't want to date or be in a relationship with I'm saying that after you know like a lifetime of you know I've had I've been in lots of relationships I've had casual sex too and it's not being all bad I'm not like horrified or and I don't feel traumatic by having had casual sex but also you know I'm at a point in my life where it's like I'm not having sex with somebody that I wouldn't want to be in a relationship with um and I think men should think about things that way as well despite the fact that their dicks don't think that way like you have to you have to understand that you operate differently than most women do like I think it's easier for men to have casual sex I think it's a lot easier for men to have casual sex than women and not feel anything about it and there not be any repercussions and that doesn't mean you should do it Yeah. But yeah, I mean, I'm sure that those kinds of men, those kinds of really liberal, like, well, adults should be able to do whatever they want to do because that suits them. And it doesn't mean that they have to be responsible. You know, you know, if she gets pregnant, she can and should have an abortion. Or I should just assume, you know, like I've heard men say like, oh, well, I just assumed she was on the pill. It was like, why on I earth know, right? would you have sex with a woman and assume she was on the pill? Like you should assume that a woman's not on the pill because the pill is awful and no woman should be on the pill. But I mean, at very least you should ask. Um, at very least <laughs> you should just pull out just in case. At very <laughs> least you should maybe have the conversation with somebody that you're having sex with. What happens if well, we get pregnant? Like, I'm like, well, she lied and said she was on the pill. I'm like, okay, here's the deal. Like we can't inseminate ourselves. Why and this is the me? other, oh, the man. other issue of the abortion conversation is, um, is, you know, men are, should not be ejaculating in women that they don't want to have a baby with. Period. No, 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 no like, like, never. Yeah. Not there's no excuse. Why would you no. ejaculate in a woman if you didn't want to make her pregnant? Right. The, a that, stupid idiot. Yeah. Right. Right. Exactly. Wear a condom or pull out, and this, you know, or be with a woman that you want to parent with. I guess. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. And it's such a weird time to be like at this point in the human story where okay, we, we needed to like experiment and see how many of those, you know, we had to, we had to break all those rules. And now it's like, okay, now I understand why that rule was put in place. Now I understand why that rule was put in place. But there, these, um, you know, cultural mores and norms were, were put here to protect people. That's, they're not entirely oppressive as I believed as a young feminist that it was all just about women being chattel. It's like, no, there's, there's a benefit to your health and to all of society and certainly to your future children to not have sex with people unless you want to have a child with them. And then certainly if you are having sex and you don't want to, um, to be having children, you should be using multiple levels of avoiding that. Yeah. And we don't live in a perfect world. So that's not happening, which is why abortion needs to stay legal. And even if all of that were happening, women can still end up in situations where, they get diagnosed with cancer when they're pregnant or their husband goes insane or whatever happens and they can't stay pregnant. So abortion will always be necessary, no matter, even when people are only having sex in loving, committed relationships, it still remains a necessary part of human life. Even when people are only having <laughs> sex in committed marriages and <laughs> trying to start a family. Yes, just like we always have been, you know, just like the olden days. Just like the olden days, like it's just the world is is uh, messy and complicated, and and yeah. And, I mean, but, people also like I don't know. There's so many weird aspects to this conversation because people then act like 
it should be the women's entire responsibility and she should be keeping her legs closed then and you know she shouldn't be whoring around unless she wants to have a baby and if she gets pregnant that's her problem as though like women you know and men men don't yeah. have to be responsible for that because they're men and you know they have these crazy sex drives as though like women don't have sex drives too it's I like know. women have casual sex with men because they're attracted to those men and turned on and they want to have sex like we also enjoy sex and have sex drives and you know humans right. are like it's hard it's <laughs> it's hard on like i'm saying on one hand like you should yeah you should try to be thoughtful about who you're having sex with and under what circumstances but people are always especially like young people who are less savvy about the choices they're making gonna be driven by desires and and lust and things like that and yeah well and then then we get into the whole other layer of a lot of women, and I'm not talking about women who are being prostituted, I'm talking about just regular women, are having transactional sex with men because of the world that we live in. It's like, you know, I need a place to live and I can't afford rent by myself, so I'm going to have sex with this guy and we'll live together, you know? Like, there's a lot of that going on, too, where it's, um, you know, it's not... Um, it's not, I wouldn't call it a prostitution situation, but I would call it transactional sex is happening. And that, that's just a reality of a lot of women's lives. And women are compartmentalizing and women seeking sugar daddies who will pay for stuff mm. and take them on trips. And, you know, all they have to do is have sex with these guys and not really think about it. You know, I bet there's some argument to be made about the pill contributing to that because you can like, you're, maybe you don't have a libido anyway, so you may as well just have sex with this old guy you're not attracted to if you're attracted to nobody, which is exactly side effect yeah. of the pill, right? Totally. And you're, you're on Prozac, so you can't have an orgasm. So you have no And you're on Prozac, so you can, don't have any feelings anyway. All of your <laughs> totally. feelings are shut down. So sure, so. you can just think about nothing like you do for the rest of the day while you're having <laughs> sex with somebody that you're actually disgusted by, and at least you'll get a purse and like a trip yeah. to Cabo or whatever. Yeah. What a time Dark. we live in. So I, I don't know. I think it's interesting watching us get played by the culture wars and seeing the pool now between the I know so many people in my personal life who are so angry at the Democrats that they are seriously voting Republican now because of the lockdown tyranny, because of the forced vaccinations, and at, very much because of the transgender issue. And then you have the issue of abortion thrown into to that mix. Like we're just we just get played. Like you you can't. Yeah. There's crazy on every side. So I'm wondering how it's going to play out. I do think overturning Roe versus Wade is the only reason why we didn't have a red wave in, in 2022. I think that the Republicans would have won so majorly if they had not overturned abortion rights. Because I think, like Bacha Unger says, that working class people want abortion to be to be legal, whether or not they personally approve of a decision to get an abortion they well, yeah, if you're poor it. and you yeah. can't afford to have another kid, and you're like, if we have another kid, we're not going to be able to feed the kid or pay our rent, then that's rough, yeah. right? You know, like women in the States don't even get maternity leave. Um, and women who declare them pro-life are, are honestly just as likely to end up having an abortion as women who declare themselves pro-choice. Like when right. you were in that situation, it is completely different than whenever you're hypothesizing about that situation. Yeah. I mean, I, I mean, in Canada, you know, Pierre Polyevre is probably going to win the next federal election. Yeah. He, he's a conservative and there's no real abortion debate in Canada. So, I mean, it's like the everybody is so angry at Trudeau and the NDP <laughs> for what they did during COVID in particular. Mm -hmm. And I think people are angry about the trans issue as well. And, you know, the drug problem and the homeless, homelessness problem. Like we're, there's a lot of sort of similar issues in the, in Canada that are, we're seeing in the U S that are leading people to move. Right. We just don't have such an extreme, right. I did want to ask you, like, do you think that overturning Roe was really such a big deal? I think Roe was a very flawed decision. I really think um, they should have argued that the right to abortion is included in the 14th Amendment and in the, um, that this, the, you know, I think they should have argued it differently rather than make up the right to privacy. Um, I think that 
the whole languaging of Roe was unfortunate. It was all about protecting doctors and their right to perform abortions. It really wasn't about women having a right. The whole thing is mm -hmm. women and her doctor, women and her doctor or doctor physicians have a right to, to do this. I, um, I wasn't a huge fan of Roe v. Wade, but I think overturning Roe v. Wade has created so much suffering. And, and I see it because I live in New Mexico, which is a state with um, really liberal abortion laws. And we're probably the only state in the country that is overserved in abortion services. Like we, we have more than the women of our individual state would need. And we are having women flocking here from Texas, Oklahoma, from other states. And, um, I think it's awful. I, I I think it's terrible that women in Texas have to travel, you know, 500 miles to get an abortion. So I, yeah, I think it was a big deal. Um, but Roe was a flawed decision to begin with, not for the reasons the right says it was, but from a, a feminist perspective, from a perspective of someone who loves women, I, I think, I think they should have just declared a, a right to bodily autonomy period. Yeah. Yeah. Instead of the way it was written, like, you know, up to the states, up to this, this many weeks, then the states can, can regulate after this. And it, you know, just a very weird decision to begin with. I'm just, yeah. I'm just so offended at the idea that other people should be able to vote on what a woman does with their body. Yes. Absolutely. No. And, and it's just so dehumanizing to women. You can't force women to complete pregnancies. Pregnancy is, is, it is a threat to your health, your life. I say this is a midwife where I'm, you know, I love birth. I think freely chosen birth is like the most amazing experience a human being can have. It's just, you know, it's incredible. But you, it, to force a woman to do it is torture, literally. And it's, um, it could kill her. It literally could kill her. It certainly can leave her with lifelong disabilities. And who will take care of that baby she doesn't want? It's going to create trauma to to the infant to force a woman to have a child she doesn't want. She will either be raising a child that she's resentful of, or she'll place the baby for adoption, which always creates trauma. And mm -hmm. I just can't even believe this is that we're having this discussion. It's so dehumanizing to women and to babies. Yeah. Well, I'm glad that we resolved all that. I hope everyone was listening. <laughs> Stop the gender services. Stop the gender clinics. It's all bullshit. And uh, you don't get to have an opinion about abortion unless you're having one. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right. Wow. So we'll see you next week. We yeah, I just want to plug my event before we log off, which Go is for it. we're coming to Victoria to force Dave Eby to apologize to me personally and unban me from his Twitter account. Um, Dave Eby is my premier, the premier of BC. He has blocked me, sorry, not banned. He's blocked me on Twitter. He blocked me one year ago, almost to the day on International Women's Day in 2023 because he said trans women are women and I said, prove it. Um, and uh, last time we were in Victoria trying to speak about uh, gender identity ideology and the impact on kids in particular was that one million march in Victoria where we were essentially run out of town because the unions shipped in hundreds and hundreds of protesters to literally attack us. They broke past the barricades. The police didn't even try to stop them. We did an FOI and the police knew that all these protesters were coming and were woefully unprepared. Um, so it did, it did become far too dangerous for us to be there. He shut, they, one of the cops shut down my talk mid talk. I was, you know, maybe five minutes in tops. Um, um, yeah, the protesters broke past the barriers, were hurling themselves at the stage. One of them cold clocked a cop. Um, it was really scary. Um, but yeah, so we've never done, I don't think there's ever been, no, I'm certain there's never been an event in Victoria, BC's capital, um, where the legislature is, um, about gender identity. We did do one in Nanaimo, which is... Um, close to Victoria, but a smaller city, town. Um, and we tried to do one at the Cowichan Community Center in the Cowichan Valley in Duncan, which is a smaller town about an hour from the Nanaimo. And the Cowichan Community Center canceled us, pre-accusing us of hate speech. 
Um, and we did one, where did we do one? Another little town on the island, but we've not been able to do something in Victoria. We were very, very, very worried about being able to find a venue because usually what happens is we lose the venue once protesters find out where the event is and they start calling and harassing and threatening the venue. Um, that happened to us twice over on the island. It's happened to us in Vancouver. Um, but we found a venue in downtown Victoria and they're supportive of our cause. And they're very, we didn't know this when we booked them. We found out after, like we did, we explained to them, we're like, listen, this is the topic. Just so you know, this is controversial. Um, and it's likely you'll get protesters like because we're trying to not get canceled last minute. So we want to give you a warning and see if you're okay with that. And if not, we should find somewhere else. And the guy was like, sure, that's fine. Yeah, whatever. It just seemed like unconcerned. And then when a couple of the women that I'm organizing with went down to the venue to check it out and meet him, he was like really excited and was like, want to do more events like this at his venue nice. and it's an awesome venue and he was like he was just he loves what we're doing and this is just i don't think this has ever happened to me in canada before and i certainly did not like wow. that in victoria so we're really really excited and um yeah and so for people who want to buy tickets it's on may 30th which is a thursday um, we're doing a panel discussion and Q&A. And then after we're having like a meet and greet cocktail hour, there's a beautiful, like a nice little bar in there. So we're going to like hang out and have a little party after. And um, we're going to have security. And I'm pretty positive there's going to be a police presence and all that. I'm sure will be as stressful as it always is for me. But um, anyway, I hope that people who are over on the island come to our first ever event in Victoria um, and that then you all vote the NDP out. <laughs> awesome. So I put that link in the show notes on YouTube. I'm going to just stick it in the live chat right now. <clears throat> it's I'm almost positive that I'll sell out. So I do recommend getting tickets as soon as you can. Um, and somebody earlier in the chat said that I should make a t-shirt that says men aren't women though with the Twitter logo, which I have done. And I did it probably like a year ago. I just don't, I'm not good at advertising merch or selling things. I'm a terrible capitalist, I always say, but it's over on spring. And um, I think it's linked to on my YouTube channel there. So that's there. Do you have anything you want to add, Mary Lou? Um, no, if people would like to, um, to read about the diaper industry and child-led parenting and five-year-olds in diapers. I have an article up on my Substack and Channeled Family Medicine Substack, so you can check it out. And yeah, it's great talking to you, all these infuriating topics. Yes, I really <laughs> enjoyed that conversation. Me too. Um, and yeah, Mary Lou's website is enchantedfamilymedicine.com. She's on Substack at Mary Lou Singleton. And we'll be back next Wednesday evening. So like and subscribe so that you don't miss the live. And thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks, everybody. Okay, bye. Good night.